I've been at CUNY nine years uh, this autumn. It's gone very quickly. As you mentioned, I was at the BBC for 20 years before that, uh, mainly in BBC News. The point being that um, all of my predecessors as director of Q, way back to the early mid uh, 19th century, been eminent botanists. And the Q slightly broke with history in appointing me. So I always feel I have to sort of slightly apologize for the fact that I'm not an eminent botanist. I did originally study natural sciences at university, but I've always been passionate about science and nature and, and public engagement with science and nature as well. So let me see if I can share my images and we will canter through the presentation. Could someone just sort of indicate if you can see that? Yep. Excellent, thank you. So this is what I'm gonna try and talk about. Why does protecting nature matter? What are the global challenges it faces and what is Q trying to do to find solutions to these urgent problems? So this very first question, why should we care? Why protect nature? Why should we care? And I think there are, in essence, three different sets of answers. But the point I want to stress throughout is this very simple one, all life depends on plants. This is uh, a Sumatran uh, orangutan, one of our closest living relatives, one of the very few great apes still alive on this planet. It is, of course, an incredibly beautiful animal. It is critically endangered. And the reason it's critically endangered is habitat loss. And of course, your eye is immediately drawn, of course, to the ape, but then look around and you see the tropical rainforest on which it is entirely dependent. So one of the points I'm trying to stress in this uh, talk is that all life depends on plants. Think of plants as a life support system for animals and think of fungi as a life support system for plants. So all life depends on plants. That leads us immediately to these utilitarian arguments about nature. Uh, plants provide us with oxygen. They draw down carbon dioxide. They provide rainfall and our water supply. These are all called ecosystem services or natural capital. And of course they're provided free. And because they're provided free, they tend to be abused and misused. So most obviously plants provide food. And it's a striking fact that just three crop species account for 50% of all human calories. That's maize, rice and wheat. And about 75% of all global crops feeding humanity rely on animal pollinators. Again, those pollinator services all provided entirely free. But without those insect pollinators, human population would starve. Uh, plants provide fuel for about 1 billion of the world's poorest people, wood of course, and plants and fungi are the source of about 60% of our cancer treatments. One of the things that plants do is they are a source of complex chemistry. This is a molecule called vincristine, very complex organic molecule. Until recently, the only source of this plant, uh, sorry, this molecule was a plant found in Madagascar called the Madagascar periwinkle. Uh, so plants are complex chemists, but this molecule is incredibly effective at treating childhood leukemia. Uh, so plants are a source of medicines, even now in the age of nuclear medicine and science, plants are a source of complex molecules for treating medicine. Uh, treating uh, disease. And of course, many, many others are yet to be discovered or developed. For instance, only recently was the famous fungus discovered that actually digests plastic, which is clearly of great contemporary interest. And the UN in one of their recent publications estimated that about 50% of entire global GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its services. And there's a cost too of abusing nature. The most evident examples, of course, are zoonotic pandemics. And it's not just COVID. Before that, there were SARS, MERS and HIV. And the, the consensus, not yet proven, but the consensus among scientists is that these have come from uh, proximity of humans with nature, largely through the degradation of nature. So these are all utilitarian arguments for protecting nature. But I think there's also a moral case, oh, sorry, this is a quote from Professor Sandra Diaz, who led the, uh, the UN report on um, biodiversity in 2019. And you can see her view about the link between environmental degradation and uh, zoonotic diseases. So these are all utilitarian arguments for protecting nature. But I think there is also, um, Oh, yes, this is, uh, uh, this is from the quote, sorry, this is from the UN report just last week. So this is the first time that the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has worked jointly with the International Panel on Climate Change. And increasingly, these two problems are being seen as two sides of the same coin. I mean, this was the UN opinion just last week about the role that nature can play in helping to address uh, 
some of the consequences of biodiversity. And although estimates vary between about 10 and 30 percent, that is the proportion of the current CO2 problem that we face that can be addressed through nature-based solutions. So nature alone can't solve the very high levels of carbon dioxide we currently have, but it can play a very material role in reducing that atmospheric CO2. So these are all utilitarian arguments for protecting nature, but I think there's also a moral argument. This amazing image, uh, famously called Earthrise, of course, was taken from Apollo 8 in December 1968, and it was the first time the moon had been seen from space with the Earth obviously in the foreground, Apollo 8 being the first one to actually go around the moon. And it was the first time humans had seen their planet like this, alone, the famous blue dot in, in, in the cosmos. On that planet, there are at least 8 million species of plants and animals, plants and animals alone, many, many more when fungi are added, let alone bacteria, of course, and other microbes. Uh, fungi, no one really knows, maybe between 3 and 5 million species. Um, but just one species, of course, is causing all the problems. So we are uh, what's been termed the god species. We are utterly dominant and we have great responsibility, I would argue, for our planet and all the species on it. It is the only planet, of course, we know that supports life. And we are the only species on this planet capable of protecting the diversity of life on Earth. So that is the moral argument. And then finally, I would cite a humanitarian argument for the benefit of future generations. This is a quote from Jonas Salk, the um, uh, inventor of the polio vaccine. But I would argue that at the moment we are emphatically and evidentially failing to be good ancestors. So the simple point is, I think there are many uh, important reasons why biodiversity matters. What are the challenges facing nature? Well, the first is climate change. Um, currently, the UN believes that climate change is the third main reason for biodiversity loss. <clears throat> and you might think, well, how can climate change cause biodiversity loss? Well, the illustration on the left, for example, is the, uh, the fires in Australia in 2019. It destroyed whole ecosystems. Some plants, for instance, were uh, threatened with extinction and probably many invertebrates were made extinct through these fires, but we will never know. Uh, but another good example is the threat facing the Great Barrier Reef, one of the great ecosystems of the world, but corals are incredibly sensitive to both increases in temperature, and of course the ocean is warming up, and increases in acidification of the ocean. And of course, as there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, more is absorbed into the ocean, it becomes more acidic. So climate change alone is destroying ecosystems. Another example is an alpine habitat. If you think of a, uh, the top of a mountain, it's like an island. It's isolated, of course, uh, geographically separate from other tops of mountains. So alpine plants in particular in Europe are greatly threatened with climate change. The second great threat facing ecosystems is degradation of ecosystems, overexploitation, the killing of sharks, for instance. You remove the top predators, you destabilize the entire ecosystem. Pollution is another example of degradation, as is deforestation or, or, or degradation of forests, even if it's not completely uh, destroyed through uh, illegal logging. You see in the United Kingdom the consequences of removing the top predators. We used to have bears and wolves in this country, we no longer do, so we've got an absolute epidemic of deer and badgers, which have got no natural predators, but it's much more serious in the great oceans. So ecosystem degradation is the second main cause for biodiversity loss. But the greatest cause is the loss of ecosystems, and the single largest reason for that is agriculture. This image is uh, in Uganda, and it's an absolutely uh, classic image where native forest has been removed for agriculture to feed, of course, uh, a growing global population. And as a result of these threats, the, the three big ones I've mentioned, we are facing a biodiversity crisis. Crisis is no exaggeration. It is our generation is witnessing an extinction crisis. And scientists estimate the current level of extinction compared with the pre-human rate is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times higher than the pre-human extinction rate. And we are currently destroying organisms before we even know they exist. So for example, about 2,000 plants are newly described to science each year. We know of about 380,000 higher plants on this planet. So that gives you a sense of the rate of increase. But in countries like Madagascar, for instance, where 90% of the old growth forest has already been lost, we are losing species even before we knew we had them. My analogy is it's a bit like burning a library 
before you've even indexed or read the books. So we have to act with urgency. This is uh, one of the quotes um, that's been uh, in the uh, UN IPBES um, report that about 50% of um, all life on earth will face extinction by the end of the century unless we change the way we are treating our planet. So that's an image of Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar, I mentioned particularly because Madagascar is the only country in the world where Kew maintains a permanent research base. <coughs> Pardon me, we've got about 30 or 40 scientists there, mainly local uh, folk working. Um, it's incredibly biodiverse. It drifted away from India about 80 million years ago. So it's large, it's tropical, and it's isolated. Uh, Kew's estimate is that about 85% of all the plants in Madagascar are found only in Madagascar. So that uh, that refers to endemism, plants or, or, or animals only found in a particular location. It's the poorest country in the world that is not at war. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, by some estimates, 90% of the old growth forest has already been lost. So it's really critical. And that is why Kew has a base there. So what are the solutions? Uh, this is a very simple chart, uh, but it, 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 it conveys, I hope, a very important uh, principle. Sometimes, that little bit in the middle, nature-based solutions can deliver three interconnected and important benefits. You can protect biodiversity, you can help mitigate climate change, and you can help build sustainable livelihoods. Biodiversity will only be protected if the local communities have sustainable livelihoods, and therefore illegal poaching or deforestation, etc., cetera, uh, ceases. And this is what Q is trying to do, trying to identify the right intervention, and we work in about 100 countries around the world, to identify the right nature-based solutions that ideally can deliver against each of these three incredibly important goals, protect biodiversity, mitigate climate change, build sustainable livelihoods. So here's an example, uh, one that Q's not been involved with, by the way. This is the mountain gorilla, 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 critically endangered. Again, one of our closest living relatives, but actually it's a success story. And I say it's a success story in that this animal was facing extinction in the wild 30 years ago, and it is still living in the wild. So it has not been made extinct. It is still critically endangered, according to the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Assessment. But the approach that's been taken most successfully in Rwanda is whole ecosystem conservation, i.e. you protect the whole ecosystem, the plants, the forest, the other animals, the whole ecosystem is protected. You provide sustainable livelihoods through uh, tourism, most evidently, but also through forest honey initiatives, through reform poacher programs, etc. You provide a long term commitment. This has to be a multi decade commitment uh, to get these solutions in place. And you have the support of the government, ideally with the rule of law uh, and, and the avoidance of corruption. Uh, and you find that the forest provides sustainable ecosystem services for the local community. So it is a success story, but I don't want to uh, overrate this. This animal is still critically endangered. These are just a few um, simple headlines, really. I suppose the point I would stress is that, in general, we know what the solutions are, but it's incredibly complicated to deliver long-term sustainable solutions, particularly in some of the poorest countries in the world. And of course, most biodiversity exists in the tropics. Um, as a result of the ecosystems that exist there. So although we know what the solutions are, delivering them will be hard and it requires multi-decadal commitment. This is a great quote, of course, from our local resident. And he's absolutely right. We are at a critical moment in the history of humanity, in the history of biodiversity on this planet. And what we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand years. A and this spirit of urgency uh, of needing to act now, I think was in many ways the defining thought in the strategy that we worked on last year in between all of the uh, challenges of COVID. We tried to look ahead at least 30 years and say, right, what can Q do if we align all of our efforts towards these twin interrelated challenges of the extinction crisis and the climate crisis, what can Q contribute? Now, many of you, of course, understandably will think of Q as a beautiful garden in Southwest London, which of course is true. It's a botanic garden. So it's a collection of wild plants, uh, unlike the, uh, the RHS or the, or, the, or the National Trust. We have about 20,000 different species at Kew, which we think is a, a more diverse living collection than any other uh, botanic garden in the world. But what we also have, and you might not be 
uh, so familiar with this is about 350 scientists working on plant science and conservation. And we have probably the world's most extensive and diverse botanical collections. So dry plant specimens, the Millennium Seed Bank, library, botanic art, plant DNA, microscope slides, etc. And so we have knowledge about wild plant diversity. And one of our challenges, one of our opportunities is how do we make that knowledge globally accessible and useful to the challenges I've been talking about. So we've come up with this mission statement. All organizations have them, sorry about that. Uh, it's very straightforward to understand and protect, understand and protect plants and fungi for the well-being of people and the future of all life on earth. Pretty simple and actually pretty much what Q's been doing for many decades, but we tried to sharpen and focus it, understand and protect plants and fungi, people and all life on earth. Uh, and we wanted to bring a spirit of both urgency and ambition to this 10-year uh, view. So in March, we published our new strategy. It's on our website. We identified five priorities. And the headline, if you only remember one thing, is that what we are trying to do now is uh, to align everything that Q does towards these global challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change mitigation. So what can we actually do? We've identified five things, and I'll talk about each briefly. The first is science-based solutions. The second is inspiring people to care. The third is to train experts. The fourth is to broaden our reach. And the fifth is to shape policy through evidence uh, and debate uh, and expertise. And I'll mention each of these in turn, and then I will finish and um, uh, some discussion, I hope. So the first one, science-based knowledge and solutions. Uh, we have all these scientists. We have these extraordinary collections. How can we use them to help solve these problems? Well. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to digitize all of those collections, in effect, to liberate that knowledge. If you're a plant scientist working in Indonesia or Mexico or Ethiopia, and I'm not referring just to the last 18 months, you cannot access our collections. You can't jump a plane, you can't come here. It's simply inaccessible. Yet we have knowledge that is useful to the protection of those uh, organisms in that area. So we want to digitize all of these collections and make them globally available, uh, free, and the right analytical tools uh, uh, and um, uh, the use of machine learning to provide insights into plant diversity. If you think of our collections as a, it's like an inventory of plant life on earth, both geographically, but also chronologically, because Kew has been collecting these specimens since at least the early part of the 19th century. So best part of 200 years. The challenge for us is the cost. Our collections are so extensive. We have seven and a half million dried plant specimens, for instance, that the cost of digitizing them is considerable. But another thing that we can do is to research the attributes of plants that are useful. So for instance, climate resilient crops. Uh, Q has recently rediscovered a wild coffee relative that can cope with about five degrees centigrade peak temperature higher than Cafe Arabica, which is the main coffee that you have in your, in your beverage. Uh, and that really matters because the world is heating up and in Ethiopia, in uh, Tanzania, in, um, um, in uh, Thailand and Brazil, where much of the world's uh, coffee is grown, the coffee crop is starting to fail because of those peak temperatures. So if we can find a wild relative that tastes good, but can cope with higher peak temperatures, that's incredibly valuable. The global coffee trade, by the way, is worth about 100 billion per annum, and it's second largest in terms of global commodities only to oil. And in Ethiopia, for instance, about 20-25% of the entire population, uh, their, their livelihoods, their jobs depend on the coffee economy. So there's a livelihood benefit as well, as I mentioned earlier. So the attributes that are useful, and finally providing evidence. Uh, Q recently was involved in persuading the Cameroonian government to protect the Ebo forest. And Q's role was to provide the evidence that a large number of endangered and endemic plants lived in that area, i.e. it was a special area that merited protecting. It's also the home for those famous chimps that have been observed using tools to crack nuts and to extract termites and so on. But that area is now protected because of the evidence that Q could provide. So our number one priority, the foundation on which all of Q is built, is the science and the solutions. Inspiring people to care. This is the role of our botanic gardens. At Kew Gardens, of course, on our second site, Wakehurst in Sussex, which if you haven't visited, 560 acres of Sussex beauty, uh, and anyone who's a Kew member has access to Wakehurst. Basically, the argument here is if people understand the importance of plants and nature, they will work to protect it. And I think that logic is sound. Our job 
is to inspire them to care through the beauty, through the stories we tell, uh, and, the, and the atmosphere, the, the, the tranquility of being in a botanic garden. We have a number of ideas uh, for investments, both at Kew and at Wake. So for example, we would like to create a carbon garden at Kew, telling the story, the relationship between plants and carbon. Plants draw down atmospheric carbon. Uh, hydrocarbons, fossil fuels, come from trapped plant materials, of course. They are the results of uh, ancient photosynthesis. And of course, the role of biofuels, very contentious area. Some people are very supportive, some people are very anti. But we want to create a carbon garden at Kew that tells these stories, a very contemporary story that we should be telling. And we have about 2.3 million visits to Kew each year and a further four or 500,000 at Waco, so quite significant reach. We want to restore the Palm House. Uh, it's our iconic glass house built, opened in 1848. It's badly in need of restoration. And the story we want to tell within it is the critical importance of tropical forests, the role they play in moderating global climate, in providing uh, uh, rainfall for crops uh, in North America, for instance, from the Amazonian basis, and of course, uh, supporting that tremendous diversity of life. And finally, we want to create a science engagement center at Kew, where we can tell these stories about contemporary plant science uh, and conservation through some flexible galleries on the site, a facility that will be open all year round. Number three, train the next generation. Of course, inspiring children is important and we want to create dedicated learning centers at both Kew and at Wakehurst for school visits. We have about 110,000 school children visit each year. We have about 100 PhD and MSc students at Kew working with various universities. And again, we want to significantly expand that, perhaps triple that number in the coming decade. And my hope is that many of these PhD and MSc students will be from all around the world, from the tropical biodiverse countries. So they will come to Kew, they will learn, they will return. The jargon is capacity building, but we need that expertise in these biodiverse countries. Extend our reach. There's a number of ideas here, but one of the fundamental ones is that Kew has always, well, since 1916, had an entrance charge. And in that sense, we're different from the British Museum or the VNA uh, and, and the Natural History Museum. My hope is that no one is unable to access Kew on the basis of affordability. So somehow we have to square the circle, earning enough on the one hand to keep us afloat financially, of course, on the other hand, making sure that absolutely everyone can afford to visit Q. So we're trying to develop some quite big ideas of how somehow we can square this circle by really broadening our access, including tackling this issue of affordability. But it's also about the stories that we tell and reconsidering some of our interpretation and making sure that we do things at Q that are relevant and engaging to all communities and they feel welcome when they're here. Q is both a charity and a public body. We get about a third of our money from government, two thirds we earn ourselves. But because we're a charity and a public body, I think we have a moral obligation to try and attract as many people as possible to our two sides. And finally, influence national opinion and policy. So this is through the provision of data and expertise, uh, both at a government level, but also a supranational level. And of course, within countries, this image is Madagascar, uh, but we do a lot of work in Tanzania, for instance. We've been doing work with the uh, Tanzanian government, for instance, since 1919. So that's a, that's a long-term commitment. We've got expertise and knowledge that is of value to them. So that's what Q is trying to do. Uh, I am often asked, what about me as an individual? What difference can I make? And, and I think I can understand why a lot of people feel very disempowered. These are big and global challenges. What can I do as a simple single individual? I think there are really important things every single individual can do. We can do all of these things, for instance. Um, David Attenborough's answer is consume less stuff, three words. And he's right, uh, consume less meat, consume fewer flights, consume less uh, disposables and consume responsibly, of course. Every single one of us can make an effort to do that. Vote. We all have votes. Uh, we can back parties and individuals that we believe are committed to these causes. We can, if we're so minded, campaign. It might be signing up to a, um, um, a pledge on something, uh, putting your name to a petition, but it might be doing more as well. Anyone who's employed can influence your employer. You can press them to adopt uh, climate responsible policies or biodiversity responsible policies. Pretty much every corporate in the UK at the moment is keen to improve or to demonstrate their green credentials. So pressure from employees can be really effective. 
uh, volunteer your time. We have about 600 volunteers at Cube, for instance, but of course you can volunteer for many, many organizations. The RSPB, for example, an important conservation organization, the National Trust, huge uh, volunteer community, incredibly reliant upon their volunteer community. And finally, of course, you can donate money. Uh, and you don't have to be rich, 10 pounds, 100 pounds, uh, it all makes a difference. Or you could become a member, that's in effect a way of donating money. So I do think there are things that every individual can do, some or all of these. And finally, this is my last slide. Uh, I like this quote. Uh, I mean, Greta Thunberg is not to everyone's uh, taste, but she has made a difference. She has raised awareness, her passion, her authenticity and commitment. And I think she's exactly right on this. This is a, a situation of genuine urgency. Uh, and, I, and I hope that Hugh in some modest way uh, will play its part in tackling this global crisis. And with that, I have finished. Uh, I will stop sharing. Uh, it's got a bit dark here, but hopefully you can still see me. It's pouring with rain. I'm sure it is for you in Richmond too. And I'm very happy to answer questions on any of that or indeed anything else. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, I think the, the message about uh, urgency came through loud and clear. Uh, before I ask uh, audience members for questions, I'd like to ask one of my own, and it's the pandemic question, which is, um, what has been the impact of the pan pandemic on uh, your visitor numbers and your revenue, of course? Well, it's uh, obviously been a challenging period. We were closed for 10 weeks. Uh, we reopened June the 1st last year. The longest queue has ever been closed. Uh, we didn't close in the Second World War. But we were closed for a little bit after the Great Storm in 87. But of course, when we reopened, it was on a greatly reduced uh, uh, way. Uh, and obviously, you know, shops have been closed, the galleries have been closed, the palace has been closed, the glass houses have been closed, and we are gradually reopening. So if you were to visit queue today, the glass houses you can enter, but uh, you know, one way only. And of course, everyone has to pre-book. And the reason for that is, although we've got lots and lots of space at queue, uh, the pinch points basically are arrival, uh, and it's our attempt to try and make sure that the two-meter social distancing is maintained. And I know it's been um, frustration, frustrating and a cause of irritation for some members that they can't just turn up. In terms of numbers, today it looks great. You know, we have a lot of people visiting. Uh, the gardens are admirably busy. There is huge demand. However, the vast majority of the visitors are members. So our income is greatly reduced because we've lost pretty much all of the tourists and the tourists buy, buy a day ticket, they buy lunch, they buy souvenirs, etc. So the volume of visitors is healthy. There's great demand to visit the gardens. Income is still seriously down. Uh, visitor related income is about half of what it was in 2019. So we have a long way to go. Uh, last year was a tough year. We did get some financial support from government. We furloughed a lot of people. Uh, so our science uh, programs were quite hard hit because a lot of the scientists were furloughed, we needed the income, but we're still afloat uh, and things are picking up. Thank you so much. Now let's go to our audience members for questions and in the chat box I see there's one from uh, Teresa Hartley. Teresa, ask your question. Yes, um, this isn't really a question about your work, but about accessibility to Wakehurst. Many Richmond and Kew residents have never visited Re Wakehurst. If you were to offer regular coach trips there, I'm sure that many people would be prepared to pay rather than drive there themselves and it would also be more eco-friendly. I, for one, have never been, although I've been a member of Kew Gardens for over 30 years. So thank you. It's a very good point. We do sometimes do exactly what you say. We have bought only about twice. Sorry? Only about twice, I think. OK, I will ask the team to do it more frequently. Whenever we do it, they are fully booked. They are very popular. We um, market them to members, exactly as you described, coach departing from Kew down to Wakehurst for the day, coming back. If you haven't visited, Wakehurst is very beautiful, completely different to Kew, of course, a very different landscape. So I will pass that back to the membership team and say, do more of them. Let's keep doing it until they're stopped, you know, until, until we've clearly met demand. Um, so yes, it's a great asset for Q members is they also have access to Wakehurst and it's very beautiful down there. The home of the Millennium Seed Bank as well, which is a very interesting conservation project. I know I've always meant to go, but of course it's an effort to drive there. It's, um, it's 53 miles from Q to Wakehurst. That's a nice day trip. Uh, okay, the next question is uh, Adam. Adam Harrison, are you there? Hello, uh, two things. You did mention restoring the palm house. I thought it had only been done about 10 years ago. 
I remember when it was completely stripped empty and then all put back and we went to look at it before the plants came in. It's a while back, I'm afraid. I think it's about 30 years ago. No, it's less than 30. Okay, I will check. I, I think you might be surprised how long ago it was. I will. Could, could I have the word, please? I was for a time being the project architect on behalf of the PSA of the Palm House Restoration, which started in 88 and completed in 91. Uh, it, it was an extremely good restoration. The mullions, the glass mullions, were the most uh, very difficult, the, the, uh, a very thin section, and it was quite difficult to manage. It's a very uh, extremely fragile construction, and the restoration was done by the uh, property service agency, uh, and as I said, I was for a very short time a project architect at the very end of it, which it was 91. Uh, and I feel that there is a failing of supporting uh, really and maintaining this very expensive restoration and only after 30 years to have to do another very expensive restoration, I think it's a total waste of money and it is lack of proper maintenance and proper care on the glass envelope of the house. I was also project architect of the extension to the Jodrell Laboratory. This is standing okay for the moment, but again, I feel that there is a, a problem with proper man, maintenance. A lot of different directors have changed over the time. And uh, also I noticed that some little constructions have been going on and off, building, wasting money uh, and resources for some little huts, uh, one behind the lake, which was built never used and then demolished. Uh, I don't know the reason for that, but I think the question with the Palm House is something which it's been done only 30 years ago and the maintenance had to be a regular and proper because it's a very, very difficult and special envelope of glass Ways aluminium mullet. Thank That's you, Zena. Can we ask Richard for any response he might have? Uh, so it was 30 years ago, yes. Um, the, the, temperature, the, the palm house is always going to be challenging. You, you've got wrought iron and cast iron with the warmth and humidity in, in a British climate. Uh, you know, that's a difficult mix. You also have a very large number of visitors um, my understanding is that about 30 to 40 years is a standard cycle for these major restorations. We're unlikely to start it, I would say, optimistically within three years. So it'll be coming up to 35 years by the time we start. I have some sympathy for the lack of proper maintenance. One of the challenges that Q faces is access to capital. We've got nearly 50 listed buildings and historic monuments at Q, eight of which are grade one, enormously expensive to maintain. And we are reliant upon DEFRA, the government department largely for capital, and it's extremely volatile. That number goes up and down very considerably. So in general, we haven't been able to maintain these properties, not just the Palm House, all of them as well as we should do. The biggest single challenge at Q is not the Palm House at the moment, though that's gonna be quite an expensive project. It's the back of house buildings where I'm sitting at the moment, the herbarium, which is a complex of six separate buildings, which needs very major renovation and redevelopment. Uh, the roof is leaking in one of the wings where our collections are kept, for instance. So there is a lot of work needed on buildings. The, the, uh, the legacy of, of, of heritage buildings is very expensive. We need to replace the roof in the Orangery, for instance, another grade one listed building. And this is all eye-wateringly expensive, but somehow we have to find a solution to this through a mixture of philanthropy. So when we restored the uh, Temperate House, three quarters of that funding came from philanthropy and government. One quarter of the cost of the Temperate House came from government but it is a constant struggle to get the capital we need to maintain uh, and uh, rejuvenate these buildings. 
Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, next question is from Janine. Janine Langrish, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, I th firstly, just to say, I think it's really sad that, that both here and on um, social media, people are threatening to drop their memberships because of the booking system. I mean, I, I'm a member because I want to support Q primarily. Though it's thank fantastic you. that I get to visit it. Um, I've, with other organisations where I'm a member, I've taken out life membership this year because I, I think they've. It's a, it's a time where a lot of people, a lot of organisations have lost a lot of funds due to lockdown. I would love to be able to do the same for Q, but that op option isn't there. And I just wondered whether you'd consider um, giving people the option of life membership. So a number of people raised this with me. We are looking at life membership for Q, just as the National Trust, for instance, has life membership. We used to do it. I think it was stopped about 10, 12 years ago. Um, I'm not sure you know, how many we'd sell, but that doesn't matter. It's a wonderful gift um, to give to yourself or to someone else. And thank you for your support. I mean, membership is incredibly important to us. We have about, um, about 80,000 memberships, but more members, of course, because people have joint and family memberships. And it's incredibly important community for us, an incredibly important and reliable source of income for us. So again, when people say to me, what can I do to help you? One of the simplest things you can do is to uh, encourage your friends to become members or buy a gift membership for them or your family. It, it really is a wonderful gift because you're giving the gift to the recipient, but also to Q, of course. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? I, would, I think um, Andy, Andy Dowding, you've got a question or two. Yeah, yeah, I've got, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it to only one. Um, first of all, Richard, can I just say uh, a fantastic uh, presentation and talk? Uh, absolutely gripping, uh, really well presented, and, and uh, I'm sure all our hundred or so attendees will have got an awful lot of value out of that, so thank you so much. Um, I, I hate to dwell on the, the funding issue, but it is a little bit of a preoccupation for all of us at the moment, post-pandemically. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think 30% of your funding on a sort of reasonably regular basis came from government. How, how does that relate to what happened before? So is that a, a diminishing percentage? Um, if it is, I guess you would expect it to continue to diminish. And, and therefore, are we going to see or, or uh, are you planning more sort of commercial events such as Key to Music and the, the cinema, all of which I'm a massive fan of? Um, but I guess there's only so far that you can go with the sort of natural conservatism that, you know, Q members will allow, will, 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 would impose on you. Well, I, I, thank you. Um, so when Q was made uh, our current governance model, we're something called a non-departmental public body under the 1983 Heritage Act. Back in 1983, about 95% of Q's money came as a direct government grant. Today, that proportion is about 30%. So the trajectory is clear. We have to be quite commercial. We have to be quite entrepreneurial. And we get income from many different sources. So science grants, philanthropy, visitor related income, membership I've mentioned, and those uh, commercial events that you mentioned, Christmas at Q, for instance, is incredibly important to us. And I rather love the fact that December is now the busiest month of the year at Q. Uh, we had 320,000 people through Christmas at Q, not last year, obviously, but the year before. Uh, and, and it brings a joy to a lot of people when historically the gardens would have just been locked and empty but it's absolutely critical to helping us pay the bills as well. You're right, we do reach capacity. Christmas at Q is now maxed out. We're not gonna do any more nights. We're not gonna cram more people in per night. We're not gonna raise the price. So we constantly have to think of what new. We do have a global commercial partnership with Procter & Gamble. We do some science for them. Uh, we license our logo to them. And that's fantastic because we get a percentage of sales of Herbal Essences shampoo, for instance, all around the world. But although the percentage is low, the volume of sales is large. And of course, that sort of income stream is unaffected by, I don't know, coronavirus or bad weather and all the other things. We don't upset the local residents with selling um, Herbal Essences in the way that um, some people get upset with uh, Cue the Music, for instance. And so we have to be quite uh, entrepreneurial. And I'm hoping we can develop other big uh, commercial partnerships like the Procter & Gamble one. The other thing I'd say about Kew Gardens is that, you know, it's a big site, it's 330 acres. I would say we're at capacity, maybe 15 days of the year. So maybe 350 days of the year, we've got spare capacity. So in a sense, it's always a version of the same question. How do we make the best of what we've already got? So for instance, we started doing cycle evenings on summer evenings. Last night was a cycle evening, uh, when normally the gardens, as I say, would have been locked and closed. So 
We continue to work at that. I am expecting government income to continue to fall. Public finances are not healthy. My request to government is, is around capital for those buildings uh, and the science buildings in particular. Thanks again, Richard. Um, any other questions from anyone? Um, do you have a follow up, Andy? Well, I was just going to say, Richard, um, I, I think it was slightly before your time, but, but Debbie and I got married uh, in a marquee just outside the palace. Um, and I think given the backlog on weddings that's going on at the moment, that, uh, I don't know, I, I'm sure there are constraints that stopped it from happening, because I guess it was probably quite a lucrative initiative for you guys. But having that marquee outside the palace and being able to sublet it for events and weddings, I think was a, a wonderful thing. And we were terribly lucky, I think, to be about the last um, re wedding reception to, to happen there. Well, thank you. Um, we are fully booked for weddings now. You're right. There's a huge backlog, and of course, we've just had to. We've just had a whole month of cancellations, of course, or, or mainly with the extension of the um, of the uh, constraints until July the 19th. But yes, it's a really important source of income for us, and we are looking at what more we can do to to, to optimize that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Bill Newton Dunn. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I was on mute. I think fantastic talk, Richard, thank you very much. Um, with the acceleration of climate change, which we're all against, but it's going to happen, would you consider planting a young baobab tree? So it wouldn't, it wouldn't survive at the moment. It wouldn't cope with a frost. We have a baobab tree in the Princess of Wales glass house, but of course it's small and young and will never achieve that um, very distinctive uh, shape. But your broader point, climate change is happening uh, and it will have a very material effect on Kew Gardens. Some of the people that work in the gardens believe that in 50 years time, we will not have beech trees in Southern England. They don't like aridity. The soil at Kew is not good at holding water. Um, you also have all the pests and uh, pathogens, of course. You see what happens with the, um, the, the, the horse chestnut, for instance, with the leaf miner. Uh, and so you will see, I think, a really considerable change in the the landscape and the species mix at Kew, without doubt. And that's, I suspect if we could travel forward 50 or 100 years, a walk around the Arboretum at Kew would be really quite a different experience. Okay. Um, I have another question of my own, if I may, uh, and it's this. How disruptive has, uh, for Kew, has been the new cycle lane along Kew Road? It, it must make life very difficult for your visitors. Well, it does. Uh, uh, it does. Um, it, it was the, the whole episode has been a little frustrating. I, I think it would have been helpful to have a little bit more um, dialogue with the, the council on this. It was put in very quickly, as you know, under the emergency legislation, then was followed up with further parking restraints on Q Green. Our principal request throughout this, we've never objected to the cycle lane because we do, of course, see the value of cycling. I hope there aren't further parking restrictions in the immediate area. And our principal request to the council is that there is a place for coaches, uh, school buses in particular, to drop off pupils. They used to stop on Q Road, but they can't do that now because of the cycle lane. And so at the moment, there is a real problem with school coaches and, and tour coaches. Um, the council's view is they should all come to Elizabeth Gate, which is the gate on Q Green, if you're familiar with it. But already, and we're way off peak busyness, uh, that is causing real problems on Kew Green and congestion. Uh, and it also means the pupils start their school visit to Kew basically in the wrong place. So we're very much hoping, and the council are trying to do this, that they can find a solution whereby uh, coaches can drop off closer to Victoria Gate, the gate on Kew Road. We, we have received a lot of complaints from members, but we basically say it's, you know, it's almost nothing to do with us. I mean, it wasn't our decision. It's obviously a council decision. Right, thank you. Thank May you I ask a question? Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. David yep. Reed. Yep. Do, do I'm ask. aware that you've got Wakehurst Place and Kew Gardens in the south of England. I, I sort of feel that the rest of the country is being left out. Is there any chance of you getting together with anything else north and do a similar service? Well, I would love to, and it's a good point. I mean, you look at Tate, they've got the Liverpool, the uh, Science Museum's got the museums in uh, Bradford and uh, York, for instance. Um, there is a wonderful botanic garden in Edinburgh, of course, separate institution. Uh, I would love to. I mean, I, I know you know this, it all comes down to resources. If the funding was there to have a Q North would be absolutely fantastic. 
the capital is one thing, you know, someone might find us X million pounds to build it. It's the running costs that are the real challenge. Uh, the Welsh National Botanic Garden was a millennium project. Beautiful garden, beautiful glass house. They have really struggled ever since to okay. get enough income to keep the operation afloat. And how is it being paid for then? So the, uh, the Welsh uh, Botanic Garden basically receives a series of bailouts from the Welsh, uh, the Welsh government, the Welsh Assembly, which was not the original intention. The original intention was that it could cover its own running costs through visitor-related income, but it's, it's always struggled to do that. So um, the only point I'm making is that if we were to do something in the north of England, you know, we'd need to find both the capital to build it and have a credible business model for maintaining it. Just so you know, Quite interestingly, a bit like the Victorians did in Britain, the, um, around the world, there is an absolute boom in opening new botanic gardens. South Korea, for instance, is in the process of building four new botanic gardens. China has opened more than 100 botanic gardens in the last decade. Um, Oman uh, is about to open its first uh, botanic garden. So in many parts of the world, this is absolute boom time for botanic gardens. Thank you. And um, there's a question here about the Red Palace from uh, Bill, Bill Newton Dunn again. again. Um, hello, it's, it's Anna, not Bill. Um, just you mentioned um, Q Palace or an earlier question, and uh, both Q Palace and Queen Charlotte's Cottage are closed in the winter. Is there any reason why they couldn't be open? Because we often take my grandchildren or visitors around and they're quite frustrated that they can't get into the Kew Palace or indeed Queen Charlotte's Cottage. So four of the uh, properties at Kew, the properties with particular royal heritage, are looked after by our partners at Kew Gardens, which is historic royal palaces. Mm. So they open the palace, the kitchens, the pagoda and Queen Charlotte's Cottage. Mm. And in essence, it comes down to the cost. It comes down to the cost of staffing them uh, to open them. So the arrangement is, as I'm sure you know, is they're only open from Easter to uh, the autumn half term. This year they opened later because historic royal palaces have had a really, really tough time in the last year. They, they've lost a lot. They lost 90% of their income last year. Uh, so I'm afraid the, the rather sad answer is they simply can't afford to open them um, more than they are already doing at the moment. Mm. That's rather sad because um, it is quite frustrating um, sometimes when visitors, visitors always, especially visitors from abroad or from afar, and they'd love to go inside these places and they just can't. But no problem. Can't Thank be done, you. it can't be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Teresa, Teresa Hartley has an idea for traffic management. Yes, um, doing some lateral thinking. I mean, where else have you thought of parking? Has it occurred to you that maybe the coaches could go into the car park at the rugby ground if you did a deal with them and then the, then the passengers could get in at the Lion Gate? Uh, so so yeah, the, there's, there's plenty of places for coaches to park. That's not the problem. I mean, Twickenham, for instance, has got lots and lots of parking space. Oh, but that's a long way away. But the rugby ground is right next to Lion Gate. Yes, the issue is where they drop off the passengers. And the school yeah. groups need to arrive at Victoria Gate, which, as you know, is quite a long way from Lion Gate. Why do they need to? Why couldn't they, why because... couldn't they go into the Lion Gate? For a number of reasons. One is that the school visit tends to start with a visit to the Palm House, but also a number of the school visits use the classrooms, which are in Museum Number no. One, which is right by Victoria Gate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for little legs, if you're eight or whatever, walking from um, Lion Gate up to Victoria Gate before you've even started, then off to the Palm House and maybe the Princess of Wales, etc., it's it's just a bit of a hike, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere, for instance, that you could make a space within Kew Gardens for them to park. Going using the driveway that takes to your um, compost heap, for instance. That's not our land. That belongs to the golf club. Uh, no, not really. I mean, I'm afraid Kew, Kew is a world heritage site, and the conversion of any green space to parking, I think, is we, we would not get planning permission for that. But I do think you need to have a, a brainstorm for some lateral thinking about the parking. I can assure you parking has occupied a great deal of thought in the last uh, 12 months since these changes were introduced. It, it is very problematic, the status quo. I mean, Thanks very much. If to, even if you were to open that gate that's at the end of the avenue, was there any way they could go in there? 
well, where would they park? Um, but they'd have to leave, well, they then have to go down to um, Old Deer Park and park on that. No, no, sorry. I mean, if they drove in there, I'm not, you know, they'd be in the gardens. I don't, I, we're not going to have coaches. I'm not saying they'd stay there. But they could go in, turn around, and come out again when they drop their passengers. It's it seems intractable, doesn't it? But uh, the, the present uh, road layout there, and that's I don't think anything's going to change there. Um, does anyone else have questions before we wrap this up for the evening? It was more of a suggestion, actually. Um, is if you had a, an email or, or or some sort of address where friends and other people who are interested could make fundraising suggestions, because there's a lot of us out here who'd like to see Q raise more money. And hopefully between us, we might come up with some good ideas. Uh, well, I'm very receptive to any good ideas. So you can either email me or there's various contact us um, uh, email addresses on the website. Thank you for your support. I mean, basically uh, all, all the income is much appreciated and invaluable. I mean, one of the great assets we have is we have, as I said earlier, more than 100,000 members many of whom are local, of course, some are dispersed. We, we have members all around the world. Um, and some of the projects we're trying to do, like the Learning Centre or the restoration of the Palm House, I'm very much hoping that members will contribute. And we have some, you know, to be frank, we have some very wealthy and extremely generous members, but we also have a large number of members who make modest contributions, but in aggregate, of course, they really add up and make a difference. Thanks very much indeed, Richard. And thanks everyone for your questions. Um, Thank you especially to Richard for this fascinating uh, talk this evening and the, the message of urgency which faces us and the planet indeed. Uh, our programme of talks now pauses for the summer. We will be back on Thursday the 16th of September with the Royal Parks Director of Parks, Tom Jarvis. We hope very much that it will be possible to meet in person at the College Theatre in Parkshot for the first time in a year and a half and gladly put Zoom blessing and curse that it is behind us. Tickets free to members will be available on Eventbrite as usual. Until then, thank you for being with us. Stay safe, have a good summer and good night.